Hello, my name is Simon Turner and I am the scientific coordinator of this collaborative project between the Anthropocene Working Group, the Haus der Kultur und der Welt, or HKW, and Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Thank you for this invitation to talk with everyone today, it's nice to be there. This presentation is very much about work in progress as we move towards ratifying a stratigraphic start to the Anthropocene. The history of the Anthropocene, its development as an idea and its global implications are a vast subject. Luckily, therefore, I am only going to be talking today about current geological research of recognising and defining the Anthropocene epoch in geological strata. So we'll have a quick introduction to the stratigraphic Anthropocene and the use of golden spikes. We'll then have a whistle-stop tour of the globe and I can show you our candidate geological sites and their sediment archives for the Anthropocene. We will finish with some thoughts on planning our event this time next year in Berlin and our project timeline. On this last part, I am talking to you today as very much a novice in the world of natural history collections, so I'm looking forward to learning a lot from this conference and talking with you. So a GSSP is a Global Boundary Stratotype Section and Point. It is an internationally agreed upon reference point on a stratigraphic section which defines the lower boundary of a stage. A stage is a succession of rock strata laid down in a single age of a geological timescale. In order to, to, to attempt to formalise the Anthropocene as a geological time unit or a new epoch, it is necessary to propose a GSSP that is approved by our parent bodies. The Subcommission on Quaternary Stratigraphy, the International Commission on Stratigraphy and the International Union of Geological Sciences. A suitable GSSP requires the following parameters. It has a need for a stratigraphic completeness across the GSSP level. It needs to have an adequate thickness or time above and below the boundary. The GSSP needs to be accessible with provision for conservation and protection. And the GSSP should show at least one primary global stratigraphic marker with one or ideally multiple secondary markers. There should also be the possibility of numerical dating uh, for succession. Um, it's certainly considered an advantage. So a GSSP you're likely to have heard of <coughs> is that marked by the iridium rich layer associated with the meteorite impact an extinction event that forms the boundary between the Cretaceous and Paleocene at 66 million years ago. There are actual golden spikes or alloy replicas inserted into outcrops of geological formations globally to represent specific boundaries. The end of the Cretaceous one, for example, is in a cliff face in Tunisia. So what do we mean by the Anthropocene? The concept that human activity has a significant impact on geological processes over the time span of human history is not new and there is much debate about where or when it began. We recognise the long record of pre-industrial human impacts as shown here at the bottom of the slide. However, these have increased in magnitude relatively slowly and are strongly time transgressive. By comparison with the extraordinarily rapid and near globally synchronous changes of a modern industrial period. From a stratigraphic perspective, these pre industrial anthropogenic signals are not rejected. They have long been a key characteristic and distinguishing feature of the Holocene. Other earlier start times have been and no doubt will continue to be proposed as suitable candidates for the start of the Anthropocene or even new future configurations of the Holocene. Although GSPs are literally set in stone, they are contested and capable of being moved. The Anthropocene we are working on and where we are looking to place the GSSP is that identified to have occurred in the mid 20th century. Decades of research, especially within the International Geosphere Biosphere Programme and Earth Systems Science Communities, led to the recognition that there were unprecedented and sharp upward inflections of many socio-economic and earth system trends of global significance in the mid 20th century. The term for this, for great acceleration, was coined in a Dahlem conference in Berlin in 2005 
that included social scientists and humanities scholars in addition to natural scientists. <clears throat> in the late 1940s and early 1950s, technological, political and economic systems under development in previous decades came together quite literally in an explosion of population and, and industrial growth and the acceleration of using planetary resources. So the broader social and cultural aspects of the onset of the Anthropocene are fascinating and relevant to understanding contemporary times. But the mandate given to us from the International Commission of Stratigraphy is to pursue ratification of a stratigraphic start of the Anthropocene to the mid 20th century. After much research, debate and discussion, voting took place at the International Geological Congress in Cape Town 2016, where the following points were agreed on. So by majority vote, the Anthropocene was recognised as stratigraphically real, it should be formalised, it should be at an epoch level, the boundary should be at the mid 20th century, the definition should be by a golden spike or GSSP, and the primary marker or guide should be the atom bomb spike. The reason for the primary guide being this atom bomb spike is that mid 20th century stratigraphic sequences globally are unique in containing human generated radioactive elements. Their abundance and type of radioactive isotopes are due to their mode and moment of origin, being produced by nuclear energy power plants and or from detonation of atomic weapons. Reactors and explosions have left a unique radionuclide signal that will persist for 100,000 years or so. <clears throat> to the right here is a pretty good example of radionuclide stratigraphy from the bottom of an Australian lake. You can see a sudden onset and then strong peak signal of 239 and 240 plutonium isotopes that is derived from peak atmospheric atomic weapons testing prior to the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in 1963. The other element here, shown in black squares, is cesium-137 but is also derived from nuclear weapons testing as well as nuclear accidents such as Chernobyl in 1986. Although testing and detonations took place from 1945 onwards, it was only from 1952 that thermonuclear weapons began to be extensively tested above ground and in the atmosphere but led to a truly global dispersion and deposition of isotopes. Around a decade, decade later, with approaching international treaties being signed to limit nuclear weapons tests, nuclear nations accelerated their testing programs, leading to a large increase from the early 1950s, resulting in a peak in atmospheric concentrations occurring in 1963. If we look at sediment sequences deposited in the last couple of centuries, we can also see the particular and chemical signatures of fossil fuel emissions from the Industrial Revolution onwards. We can observe this with global sediment records of particles formed only by high temperature coal and oil combustion, uh, for example spheroidal carbonaceous particles shown here. These are transported in the atmosphere and deposited into lakes and seas worldwide. This slide shows a compilation of SCP accumulation records from lakes around the world. In these independently dated sediment cores we see their occurrence First, in the mid to late 19th century, a variable increase in the early 20th century and rapidly from the mid 20th century. Declining rates near the present are in line with decreasing fossil fuel use and implementation of clean combustion technologies. Somewhat like the spread of agriculture in the Holocene, intensive fossil fuel combustion did not start at the same time, place or with the same intensity. The mid 20th century Great Acceleration, shown on the slide here as grey shading, does however occur as a more synchronous feature. As well as the accumulation of artificial radionuclides and fossil fuel combustion products, anthropocene sequences also contain novel synthetic materials. A vast array of metals, alloys, isotopes, polymers, minerals and pollutants. A list of such materials here on the left can be seen with their date of invention or production, 
over the last 200 years. Some synthetic materials have a long history of production and dispersal into the environment, like Portland cement and fly ash. However, other polymers, for example polyethylene terephthalate or PET, have only existed for a matter of decades. Mass production and technological advances in the mid 20th century saw a proliferation of new materials and incorporation into depositional environments via waste streams. This asynchronous nature of invention, production and waste dispersal, as well as the ability to measure them in sequences, provides a reliable biostratigraphic approach to dating and propertine sequences like fossils in rocks. To the right here is one of my attempts at applying an Anthropocene contaminant biostratigraphic, biostratigraphic approach, <clears throat> compiling a historical sediment record of microplastics from a North London lake. We found a low background in older sediments due to sampling contamination. It appears microplastics do get everywhere, but we nonetheless found an increase in diversity of microplastics from around the mid-1950s to the present that we could compare with other chronological markers, for example, SCPs here, shown on the right. So from both Earth system science and recent stratigraphic records, we recognise that the Anthropocene is functionally and stratigraphically distinct from the Holocene. There continues, however, a clear dichotomy preferred by the majority of the AWG of an epoch commencing in the mid-20th century from an altogether different concept of a longer-term Anthropocene of diachronous anthropogenic impact on the planet throughout the Holocene. Alternative definitions of what the Anthropocene is and when it started continue to be promoted and discussed within the fields of archaeology, geography and anthropology and the humanities, even within the AWG, which is no bad thing. Irrespective of whether the definition is eventually formalised, it is obvious that the wider Anthropocene concept is of great interest outside of the geosciences. It is a useful concept to frame social, ecological, artistic and political thought, but there is a lot of inconsistency in its meaning. So, <clears throat> here then are the locations around the planet of our potential GSSP sites. The sites are all suitable depositional environments and are geographically dispersed enough to identify globally synchronous markers of the Anthropocene. We have a selection of marine, estuarine, lake and coral cores, as well as a speleothem sequence and terrestrial peat. Site selection has been a 10 plus year process to find sites with annually resolved sediment resolution and archivable core material. Each site has been volunteered by research groups who have been actively involved in studying these sections often for so many years. Unfortunately, there are no current candidate sections from South America and Africa. Beppu Bay in Japan has a yellow depth here as their inclusion with a collaborative project has just begun. And our little Cayman coral site has now migrated to the Gulf of Mexico due to COVID travel restrictions on fieldwork this last year. So this will very much be a rapid tour of the sites we are using. Just before, shown here are our sites along the top that we will visit in order, and the dots represent those analyses proposed to be measured. Orange and green cells represent where we currently are with processing in orange and completed in green. <clears throat> Not all analyses are being applied to all cores due to the variety of sediment matrices being unsuitable sometimes for some markers. We have on the left here a range of radionuclide, stable isotopes, metal and organic contaminants and indeed indicators of nutrient changes and atmospheric chemistry, many of which have been commonly used in Holocene and modern sediments to indicate a range of human activities. We are measuring therefore not just the change in sediment fabric of the geological successions, but the timing and diversity of synthetic materials. Where fossil remains are preserved, these are also being used to provide biostratigraphic information as well as a record of the impact of human activity on the ecology of the depositional systems. 
as you can see by the dots on their own, we are very much in the active phase of data collection. It has not been a great year to try and run a global scientific endeavour, but the scientists involved have been tremendous in being able to do as much as they can to keep this project moving along. <clears throat> Starting with the Baltic Sea then. This is the core collected from the East Gotland Basin at 240 metres water depth. It's a finely bedded marine silt and clay succession, spanning the last couple of hundred years. This is work being led by Jerome Kaiser and Juliana Ivaldesol at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Germany. Previous work on cores from the basin and results so far provide a very well resolved chronology spanning the 20th century, including defined cesium and americium isotope peaks from nuclear weapons tests and from the Chernobyl accident that was spread over much of the Baltic catchment in 1986. Bomb radiocarbon measurements have just been completed that confirm the depth of both the onset and peak of radionuclides and further plutonium isotopic work is underway. This core is also being examined to provide a historical record of microplastics. Moving on, we have two sites here from the San Francisco Bay area on the western coast of the USA. The bay itself contains a lot of mud, not least due to the efforts of mining during the California gold rush in the mid 19th century, but also due to soil erosion and more recent land use changes, such as wetland reclamation. So we have two potential GSSP cores, one collected from the shallow estuary of the South Bay, marked in by the blue dot, and a core from Searsville Reservoir, built in 1891 to the south of San Francisco in Stanford, uh, marked by the green dot. <clears throat> there is a very rich Anthropocene narrative here of geology and human history, of gold itself and the destruction of indigenous communities for its extraction, city growth and global migrations, as well as golden spikes itself. The original one being used to mark the completion of the first transcontinental railroad across the United States is held at Stanford University, from which we have scientists studying the reservoir sediments. This then shows the theoretical stratigraphy of invasive species being investigated in the estuarine marine core from the South Bay. The core itself is a homogeneous grey tube, so I thought this would be more interesting to look at. The date line is shown on the left, with the oldest of the bottom going upwards, and the range of species and their dates of first arrival shown going from left to right. This is a core collected and being analysed by Stephen Himson and Mark Williams, both at Leicester University, in collaboration with the United States Geological Service. Because of the known historical records of invasive species of shellfish and foraminifera, the core is being investigated using a classic biostratigraphic approach of fossil zonation to date the sequence along with other independent dating methods. This then is Searsville Lake, constructed as a reservoir by placing a 20 metre concrete dam across a small valley. It is now, however, largely redundant for water storage, as it has filled by 95% of its capacity with sediment, as shown here. Lake sediment mud cores reveal a historical record of winter sediment inwash events and low energy summer conditions. These layers are visible when the core is split and especially with more detail when they are CT scanned and subject to image analysis. By counting in wash events and distinguishing significant disturbance in the catchment, like the 1906 and 1989 earthquakes, as well as independent core dating techniques, a high resolution chronology has been constructed back to the time of the lake's formation. Moving to the other side of the American continent, this is Crawford Lake in southern Ontario. Due to seasonal water chemistry and biological changes, sediments of the bottom have been deposited as finely laminated annual layers, as you can see in the middle of the slide here. This is work being coordinated by Francine McCarthy at Brock University and Tim Patterson at Carleton University, 
Cores have been collected using ice wedge corers, but preserve the microfabric structure of the sediment. Previous paleolimnological work showed two distinct zones of disturbance, the first in the lower part of the core around the 13th century AD, and again in the upper part of the core in the 19th and 20th centuries from early and modern industries. The lower disturbance phase contains evidence of increased nutrient loads from an Iroquoian settlement and plant remains specific to pre-European farming methods. Our third lake being investigated is Sihai Longwan Ma Lake, found in northeast China near the North Korea border. This is work being undertaken by Yongming Han and colleagues at the Institute of Earth and Environment, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Again, this relatively small and deep volcanic formed lake contains seasonally laminated or varved sediments, recording changing lake conditions and atmospheric materials introduced to the very small catchment and lake surface itself. You can see here multiple cores collected by the Chinese team, again using an ice wedge corer with very distinct layers and colour changes in the core. Based on previous work by the Chinese team, we are likely to find in this potential GSSP a very distinct mid 20th century onset of fossil fuel combustion products compared to the gradual late 19th century increase then acceleration usually observed in Europe and North America. Moving away from murky marine and lake waters, we head to clear blue seas and our potential coral GSSPs. This is work being coordinated and conducted by Yen Sinka at the University of Leicester, Christine DeLong at Louisiana State University in the USA, and a team from the Australian Institute of Marine Science. You can see here X-ray images of the Great Barrier Reef coral core we are using, and what you can see are shades of grey, which are couplets of high density and low density annual bands formed as the coral has grown. A range of standard isotopic, radiometric and geochemical measurements used for coral are now currently being measured. We are also looking to see how fossil fuel derived contaminants have been incorporated into the skeletal structure. OK, so I put this here just to highlight the amazing chronologies capable of being obtained from coral cores. Within these layers, you can identify sub-monthly differences as the corals have responded to changing water temperatures and salinity. I think if you're thinking of discussing stratigraphy and the influence of both global and local conditions on life on Earth, then coral cores, I think, are one of the best archives we have to physically illustrate the Anthropocene. Now, south to Antarctica and our potential ice core GSSP. <clears throat> this is the Palmer ice core collected in 2012 by Liz Thomas and the British Antarctic Survey. The core was collected from the southern end of the Antarctic Peninsula. Although perhaps not the easiest GSSP to access in the field, a precedent of access and availability is already set by the Holocene GSSPs, the ice cores containing them being kept in freeze storage and made available to researchers from those institutions. The British Antarctic Survey team have just completed their analysis of the core to confirm the dating of the core back to 1617 AD. And they've done this by annual snow layer counting and comparing with known historical volcanic ash layers. Continuous flow analysis, where entire core sections are melted and fed straight into a mass spectrometer for isotopic and gas analysis, has also just been completed. Subsamples are now being prepared for plutonium, isotopic analysis, trace metals and spheroidal carbonaceous particles. <clears throat> In contrast for, to the 30 odd metres of ice, here is a thin section of a proposed Anthropocene speleothem sequence from Ernesto Cave in Northern Italy. What you see here in thin section are translucent calcite layers up to 120 microns thick and brown calcite layers enriched in soil derived organic matter and trace elements. This is work that has been conducted by Andrea Borsato and Silvia Friscia at the University of Newcastle, New South Wales and Ian Fairchild at the University of Birmingham, UK. While an extraordinary and detailed resolution of layers are found in the speleothem, 
the very small scale of a record makes it a challenge to currently analyse other geochemical and radiometric indicators of the Anthropocene. Similarly to the ice core, there is, however, the precedent set by the Upper Holocene Megalion, GSSP, of 4,200 years ago, that occurs in the Speleothem from northeast India. <clears throat> Slightly larger than a few millimetres and providing plenty of material for stratigraphic analysis is this ombotrophic peat sequence, volunteered by Barbara Fialkovich Kozil and her team at Adam Mikovich University in Poland. The core is from Śnieżka Mountain in the Sudeten mountain range that straddles the Czech Republic, Poland and Germany. The peat monolith shown here, of about 70 centimetres in length, was collected by Barbara's team in August 2020. Previous work from the location has shown that peat has captured atmospheric contaminants blown in from around Europe, and we see very distinctly the input of metals and other markers of fossil fuel combustion in the mid 20th century. The peat sequence has also been very effective at capturing global plutonium and other radioisotopes. Last but not least, this is a view of Beppu Bay in southern Japan that has recently joined the endeavour. The Japanese team have been working on a series of cores from the bay for many years, producing detailed records of industrial contaminants, nutrient inputs and, rather uniquely, fossil fish scales, recording the changes in sardine abundance due to changing water temperatures and the fishing industry. We are on track then, in the next year or so, to be proposing a stratigraphic start for the Anthropocene with the identification of a GSSP from one of these sequences. The analysis of cores is scheduled until 2021, with each site to be separately written up then in a peer-reviewed open access journal by mid-May 2022. In May 2022, we will be presenting a series of lectures, performances and installations at Huckabay to explore the relationship between evidence and experiment for knowledge and knowledge production itself in the Anthropocene. In terms of physical archives and exhibitions, you can imagine we have quite a challenge ahead of us trying to incorporate and understand such a global body of evidence, but also the scale differences, for example, between ice cores and speleothems. The plan is to have an exhibit in Berlin where the actual proposed core sections are brought together for public display and analysis. The AWG will then compare and consider the proposed sites and following voting by the working group a decision of a GSSP location and auxiliary sites will be made by 20, winter 2022. A synthesis paper outlining this process and the details of the proposed GSSP will provide the basis of the formal submission to the Sub-Commission on Quaternary Stratigraphy before it is then proposed to the International Commission on Stratigraphy. If approved, it will then need to be ratified by the International Union of Geological Sciences before acceptance by the International Science Council. So we still very much have quite a long way to go in the process. We continue then to discuss our work with social scientists, artists and others wishing to collaborate and explore this term. We are incredibly fortunate to be involved with this project with Huckabe and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, both of which have intensified the introduction of the Anthropocene concept in cultural, artistic and political discussions. So I'd just like to finish, therefore, by thanking the continued efforts of the teams of scientists attached to the GSSP locations, who have been amazing this last year, keeping the research alive during some very difficult times. I am very happy to answer questions today and discuss ideas with you. Also, if you would like to get in touch afterwards, please do so by email. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi Simon, thank you so much for your talk um, and sharing this really fascinating insight. It's tremendously painful listening to your own talk, isn't it? Always. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's also like fascinating and horrifying to be seeing these signatures of recent human activity in the geological record. It paints such a clear picture, doesn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. I think when you when you work on it all the time, you forget sometimes about, you know, well, 
not forget, but there's, you know, the things like nuclear weapons we discuss all the time, but the, the horror of them sometimes gets lost in, you know, we look at their global signatures in very small amounts in sediments, but <clears throat> their potential use is terrifying, shall we say. So we've had a couple of questions already. I should say to attendees, um, Simon managed to fit his talk perfectly into the slot. So we're going to extend the session by just five minutes to make sure we get an opportunity for questions. And we'll start the next session at 10.35. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Liz Hyde, who says the criteria used to define the Anthropocene, for example, the atom bomb, the ABOM and industrial development focus entirely on the impacts of wealthy industrialized nations of the earth. <clears throat> a lot has been written about how this approach perpetuates ex exclusion of people in the global south, um, black people and people of color. I'm interested in how much this has been a consideration in the work that you've described. <clears throat> well, it is, I mean, it is a massive consideration. And I think um, the broader aspects of the Anthropocene have to incorporate everything that, that the question just contained there. I think there's very many facets of the Anthropocene and what, what, we're, what we're focusing on here is this stratigraphic record. And this idea of a GSSP is that you can identify in the geological record um, this globally synchronous marker. And for many years, we've been looking to try and identify what you can use stratigraphically to, to look at this. And so the, the, the classic example is <clears throat> the end of the Cretaceous with a big iridium spike. So that was almost a globally synchronous geological marker. And to do, and to, so to try and find anything comparable, um, what you, what you end up doing is you start, you test in things like did, um, you know, did big cultural changes leave, uh, stratigraphic, stratigraphic evidence and you, and you find regionally and locally you find, you know, you find evidence for it. But when you start looking at a global scale, you have to really, really look for something as big enough um, as massive changes in uh, atmospheric composition um, and, and the, and the spread of radionuclides. And I think, I think it's very, it's hard to sort of, um, so that's a very scientific and probably quite a cold response to sort of like thinking about the human, the human aspect of, of the Anthropocene. It's all contained in the same thing. And there's so many, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one to sort of comp not sort of understand because you don't want to sort of, you can't ignore that huge human story to the Anthropocene, but we're sort of like our pursuit is this geological one. And, and the biggest, the, the best mark we have is is the anthropocene sorry is the radionuclide release from 1950s to 1960s um i mean it's just i mean it's a fascinating thing to to to, to talk about but um really to be aware what... of and um <clears throat> i think we're kind of spanning those different different viewpoints at the moment in our collections too thank yeah. you yeah yeah and and one um, so one of the things i always say is like if if we were going to have an anthropocene collection or an anthropocene museum um which museum would we put it in would we put it in a science museum or would we put it in a natural history museum or would we put it in a cultural museum um and that's something i, I sort of think about not that i have plans to set up an institute but like it's it's because it covers so many facets that you have to sort of like how to incorporate all those very 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 different things a lot of us are thinking about um, the kind of colonial impacts um, held in our collections at the moment as well. And as Liz says, the, the, the um, perpetuating oppressive structures through this kind of. Oh, ab ab really ab absolutely. So this is the thing. So when you start talking about like, like just like nuclear weapon testing, the, 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 the colonialism involved with that and the removal of people from Pacific islands and, you know, it's, that's all part of the story. Um, and 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 to somehow recognize that human story and that um you know is all part of the anthropocene story as well we just we we are we are involved with quite a specific part of that story but it's how to embrace all of that as well no it's brilliant to see the, the specifics just one more question if that's all right um clara norden asks um she mentions a paper that's been uh, released relatively recently on atmospheric carbon pollution of in bird plumage which used a lot of um natural science history specimen, natural history specimens to measure carbon pollution on, on bird skins. 
do you think we could connect natural history specimens like these to these geological time points as well using kind of human pollutants? Yeah, um, so that's interesting with bird skins. Um, the other one I was just thinking about is there was a paper quite recently and people are quite interested in um, uh, whale, whale earwax that somehow got ended up in a specimen, you know, so, so people have been raiding, not raiding, asking politely if they can use natural history collections to look at these environmental archives. And I think it's a really good connection that, you know, natural history collections have, have got a very well curated chronology of materials from the environment that have been preserved. I, I mean, it would be an app, I'm thinking things like the coral work, you know, we, we work on coral that's been collected quite recently, but you know, there's, there's coral from all around the world, which has been you know, put into natural history collections. So I think it's a really, it's a really interesting avenue to sort of to explore because, because it's always very hard to find things which you know the date of. And quite often in, in a natural history museum collection, you have a thing which has a label and it tells you where it's from and when, and when it was from, which is, which is a great resource to, to, to use. So, yeah. We have um, a disc mail for Natsuket, which is a great way of reaching loads of um, curators around the country and around the world as well for mm. research questions. Thank you so much for those questions and for your time. And I know that you've shared your Twitter handle as well. So happy to sort of interact with attendees. Um, and yes, no Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to hand over now to Bethany Palumbo, who is chairing the first session of the conference.